When you move to the middle period Plato dialogues, you find Plato for the first time beginning to put forward positive ideas of his own, not Socrates's, but Plato's own ideas, and to argue for those ideas. Which would you say are the most important of Plato's positive doctrines? I think one has to single out two above all, the theory of forms and the doctrine that learning is recollection, the idea that to learn something is to recover from within your mind recesses uh, knowledge that you had before you were born. Let me take that one first of the two. I think a lot of people will think when they first hear this that uh, we are born knowing things. That might sound a bit bizarre, but at least very closely related ideas to that have been permanent in our Western culture. I mean, idealist philosophers have thought that there was innate knowledge or innate ideas. Most of the religions, I think, believe something of the sort. And we even have eminent contemporary thinkers like Chomsky believing that you're born with a whole grammar programmed into your mind. Now, what was Plato's version of this belief? Plato's version was that this knowledge was part of the essential nature of the soul which the soul possessed before you were born, because he believes at this period in the soul existing before it's embodied in this world. And I think to understand this theory, um, one's got to go back to those early Socratic discussions. Uh, if you look at one of these early discussions, somebody is asked for a definition of, let's say, courage, and Lakes, who's the person who's asked that, says at one point, courage is endurance. Socrates then asks him some further questions, and he always does this when he's been given a definition. He says, is courage invariably a fine and admirable quality? Yes, says Lakes. And then Socrates takes him through a number of examples of endurance, where endurance is not admirable at all, maybe very foolhardy, pig-headedness, pig -headedness, or, or yeah. it may just be morally neutral, yes. as when a some, a financer keeps on spending money, enduring the losses, because he knows he's going to get a profit at the end. So if endurance is morally neutral or bad, courage isn't, courage is always good, then courage can't be endurance. That's a typical pattern of Socratic discussion. Logically, all that's actually happened is Lakey's has been shown that his beliefs are inconsistent. If we dig all the answers together, they can't all be right because they contradict each other. But Socrates always presents the situation as one in which that definition, courage is endurance, has been refuted. So that he is in practice taking Lakey's secondary answers as either true or somehow nearer the truth than the definition and hence available as a basis for refuting the definition and saying that's the one that's got to go. Can I just uh, uh, stop you there? Because I think you've said something that's of great importance to us all today. I think we all tend to have this assumption that by discussion you can get at the truth. Whereas almost by definition discussion can't necessarily do that. All it can sh the most it can show you is that your conclusions are consonant with your premises. But of course if there's something wrong with the premises, then there'll be something wrong with the yeah. conclusion. Well, we are very attached to this idea. And if you think about it, it's actually quite hard to justify. Socrates doesn't try to justify it, he just does this and says we've now refuted the definition. But if one had to give a theory of what he's doing, uh, then one would have to say something like what I've just said and you've just implied, that we all have within us the means for making the truth vanquish the false. And that's exactly what Plato does in the Meno. He produces, as it were, a theory of Socratic or philosophical discussion which puts forward the suggestion that we all have latent within our minds the correct answers to these questions, what is courage, what is justice, and so on. And it's that knowledge deep back within, not immediately accessible, that knowledge is what enables us to knock down all the wrong answers and show they're wrong, and that knowledge is gradually emerging bit by bit in the course of that bit of discussion where, for instance, one thing that Lakey's says is used to show that some other thing that Lakey's says must be false. Mm. Now, I know that uh, in your view, the doctrine you've just expounded for us ties up directly 
with what the basis is for Plato's most famous doctrine of all, the theory of forms. That doctrine must have been the most influential part of his philosophy in the whole history of philosophy. In fact, it's what the word Platonism has historically almost come to mean. Now, can you explain that to us? Well, remember that these discussions which Socrates has are all centered on a definitional question. What is the definition of courage, of beauty, of justice? If now we have latent within ourselves the knowledge of the answers to those questions, and we have that knowledge independently of and prior to our experience of the world we live in, our using our senses, our going around from place to place, we, our knowledge is prior to that, independent of that, then surely what we know, justice, beauty, courage, must itself be independent of and prior to this empirical world we're now existing in. And that thesis is the fundamental assertion of the theory of forms, that justice, beauty and the like exist independently of and prior to all the just actions, just people, all the beautiful things, statues, objects, any that you can find, um, beauty and justice exist on their own and apart. That's the theory of forms. This theory that there is another world than this, uh, an ideal world, which is not this world, but in which everything exists that actually gives value and meaning to this world, has had incalculable influence on the whole of our culture, mm -hmm. hasn't it? Yes. It's had immense influence on Christianity, for example. I don't want to go into that now, because I think we ought to stick to the philosophy, but that's just one example of the enormous influence that it's had. Yes. Yes. And... But I think one should be careful of using phrases like the, the world of forms or another world. Plato uses them, but the contrast he has in mind is not, as one might have thought, a contrast between one set of particular things and then another one completely like it except more perfect, more abstract, somewhere else, some heaven somewhere. His contrast is between the particular and the general. Those questions, what is justice, what is beauty, are general questions. They're not questions about the here and now, and that's the contrast. There's a point in the Phaedo where Socrates is saying that to do philosophy is to rehearse for death. It is, in fact, to practice being dead. <laughs> Why? Well, because being dead is having one's soul separate from the body. And not considering the things of this world. And yeah. in doing philosophy, you are, so far as you can, separating mm. the soul from the body because you're not thinking about the here and now. If you're asking what's justice anywhere, anytime, justice in itself, you're not asking who did me wrong now, yesterday. If you're asking what's beauty, you're not asking who is the most beautiful person in this room. And if you're not thinking about the here and now, then in the sense Plato's interested in, you're not here and now. You are where your mind is, not because you're in some other particular place, but a better one, but because you're not in that in place in that sense at all. You're immersed in generalities. So it's all right to use the phrase the world of forms subject to the qualification that that means the realm of invariable generalities. 